This is Amir al Yabadi from School of Engineering at the University of Guelph. The title of my presentation is Preventing Airborne Transmission of COVID-19. And this presentation is uh, meant to be a guide for hospital workers with a science-based approach. The motivation behind this presentation uh, is the, a research project that I conducted some years ago with a specific focus on airborne transmission of uh, pathogens. Especially nowadays, it's become very relevant because we are facing a pandemic of the COVID-19. I will discuss a few topics. I will introduce the concepts of infection pathway and controls. I will introduce infectious aerosols and a few control measures that help mitigating the airborne infection pathway. These include environmental, ventilation, personal, and procedural controls. Human-to-human -human transmission of disease occurs via four pathways or routes. Transmission can be caused by contaminated water, pathogens of bloodstreams and tissues, contact and face, as well as airborne. When it comes to COVID-19, it is believed that the airborne and surface contact are main routes for transmitting the disease. A laboratory study has been conducted by Vandora Malin where uh, under lab conditions, the airborne COVID-19 aerosols that were generated uh, with a size of less than five micron in diameter were seen to remain viable and infectious for up to three hours. Also, it was observed that the COVID-19 virus can remain viable and infectious on different surfaces, including copper, uh, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic up to 72 hours. So even in laboratory setting, it was observed, and there is good reason to believe that in real conditions too, uh, airborne and surface modes of transfer could occur. So all the more reason to be conservative when uh, developing mitigation solutions to prevent the disease transmission to account for these modes. The airborne infection pathway begins um, with a source. So a carrier of the virus must aerosolize the pathogens. And then at that point, the pathogens would disperse near field up to a distance of one or two meters. Possibly the aerosols would go through some drying process because of containing um, a volatile component like water. Further, uh, the aerosols would disperse even beyond the, the one or two meters in the entire indoor space known as the far field dispersion. In the meantime, the pathogens could be deactivated by a number of environmental factors. They would possibly potentially and eventually reach a receptor inhaled and a few days after infection symptoms could develop. So the series of events would constitute the infection pathway. This pathway could be interrupted as a mitigation measure to prevent airborne disease spread. And the controls that might be used are the following. The type and the nature of the ventilation system can be designed, operated in a way to interrupt the pathway. The airflow distribution structure can be modified to interrupt the pathway. The air exchange rate, the amount of dilution of the ventilation air or ventilated air can be effective in mitigating uh, the, the spread. The environmental controls, specifically including temperature and humidity, could also deactivate uh, the pathogens. Various engineering disinfection um, techniques might be used, such as filtration and ultraviolet light, that could also deactivate the pathogens. And finally, architectural programming, the way the indoor space is used to 
can mitigate the spread. So this could involve handling patients, managing the logistics of the medical operations, and so on. As far as airborne spread of disease is concerned, various standards have been developed to, to prevent the airborne infection. In North America, these standards and guidelines are developed by the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, or ASHRAE for short. For instance, standard 170 specifically deals with ventilation of healthcare facilities. ASHRAE has a position document on airborne infection disease. Standard 62.1 is focused on ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality. ASHRAE also provides a fundamental handbook that allows uh, design and operational calculation for ventilation systems. Even most recently, ASHRAE has formed a task force to uh, deal with the recent epidemic of COVID-19. One of the important sources of uh, COVID-19 transmission are the expiratory events. These are defined as breathing, talking, coughing, and sneezing by a carrier of the virus, which could aerosolize uh, the virus and uh, disperse it in the, uh, in the air surrounding the source. Various uh, experimental studies have been conducted to measure the diameter of such aerosols, and they report a geometric mean diameter anywhere from 0.7 to 14 micrometers. And it has been uh, seen that breathing, talking, coughing, sneezing, all could contribute uh, to generation of these aerosols, although at different concentrations. If you look at the diameter of the COVID uh, virus itself, it is um, between somewhere between 60 to 140 nanometers. This is small enough to be contained in even the smallest aerosols that an expiratory event would produce. If you take the uh, size range from 0.7 to 10 micrometer uh, of the initial size of the expiratory droplet or aerosol, it's const it constitutes 94% by volume of volatile material, basically water. And when this droplet is put out in the air environment, it would go through partial evaporation until most of that volatile uh, material is evaporated. So the aerosol would shrink into a nucleus, which is 100% non-volatile. And at that point, it would not evaporate anymore. As a result, uh, the nucleus would be smaller, but the same size range, 0.7 to 10, is now 0.3 to 4 micron, which would potentially remain suspended in air for a longer period of time. The next question is, how long would aerosols remain airborne? Well, this depends on a number of factors, including aerosol size, shape, density, and most importantly, the background airflow conditions. A simplistic answer, however, can be provided, assuming unit density for the aerosol and calm or still air in the background. In such situation, one can calculate the terminal fall velocity of the aerosol and the time it takes for the aerosol to drop a vertical of distance of one meter due to its weight or gravitational settling. For instance, a 10 micron droplet would fall at a velocity of 3.1 millimeters a second, and it would take up to 5.4 minutes to drop a distance of one meter due to gravity. However, the smaller and smaller the aerosol gets, its fall velocity goes down considerably and becomes fraction of a micron per second, and it could take a long time for it to settle. For instance, a 0.1 micron aerosol could take up to 13.2 days to settle. So in, it's all the more reason to believe that COVID-19 could be sus suspended in aerosols in the air for quite 
extended periods of time. And this is not a matter of opinion, that's physics. There is uh, a lot of um, debate around physical distances now, distancing nowadays as we handle the global pandemic. And the question is, what is the science behind the recommended physical distancing that's been uh, recommended? Well, the answer should come from a conservative range for transport of airborne expiratory aerosols. Basically, we must have a clear understanding of how far aerosols would travel in air, and that range provides a recommendation for the physical distancing. And we can use science and physics to answer this question. I conducted a modeling study some years ago based on computation of fluid dynamics, where I simulated the transport of expiratory aerosols from in size range from 1 to 500 microns. I simulated uh, the injection of such uh, aerosols in an empty box filled with uh, steel air. Uh, a number of uh, equivalent volumes for the injection were considered from 0.5 liters corresponding to a very weak cough to 5 liters of injection corresponding to a very strong sneeze. And the uh, relevant velocities of such inject injections were also so different from 1.5 to almost 90 meters a second. I also tried different relative humidities in the background environment because the relative humidity affects the evaporation rate of aerosols. So I came up with nine case studies to investigate how far the injected aerosols would travel. Here are my results. You can see uh, the dispersion cloud of droplets in this figure uh, as uh, noted by color coding the, the droplets. Here the injection is going from left to right. You can see in this instance uh, somewhat uh, larger droplets would go even a little further than the smaller droplets. When I statistically analyzed the data, I tried plotting the axial um, penetration in meters of the cloud of droplets versus the size bin. So here, 1 is the smallest size bin around 1 micron, and 10 is the largest size bin around 500 micron. And I noticed that, most importantly, the uh, speed of injection or the amount of volume that's put out uh, the aerosols determine how far they go. So for the very powerful sneeze, uh, the cloud of aerosols could travel well beyond the one and a half uh, meters mark. Of course, this is very idealistic, hypothetical situation where the background air is calm. However, you could imagine the background air too be moving. There could be wind uh, outside or if in indoor conditions, air could be circulating in it, uh, as part of the ventilation system. So all the more reason this provides evidence that the um, two meter physical distance recommended is not a conservative estimate by no means. And in fact, a conservative estimate for a recommended physical distance should be much greater than two meters. Other set of controls are environmental controls, and they are mainly temperature, humidity, and processes that enable inactivating pathogens. Pathogens lose viability and infectivity, basically their ability to survive and infect over time when they are outside the host bodies. Temperature and relative humidity can impact survival and infectivity of viruses, bacteria, and fungi, but in different ways. For viruses, it has been seen that increasing temperature would deactivate them, but increasing relative humidity does not necessarily deactivate them. Depending on the type of virus, humidity can have different effects on viability and infectivity. 
For bacteria, the increasing the temperature too would help in activating their viability and effectivity. But increasing relative humidity could have result that's uh, dependent on the type of bacteria. For fungi, increasing temperature and humidity seem to promote the viability and infectivity of fungi. So it could be concluded that to prevent the spread of virus and bacteria, one needs to increase temperature. But to prevent airborne spread of fungi, one needs to decrease temperature and humidity. Pathogens are also observed to inactivate more effectively outside uh, as compared to the indoor conditions. Specifically for COVID-19, there's evidence to uh, think that it would inactivate outside more effectively. The inactivation or deactivation uh, factors um, are numerous. It has been seen that light, specifically ultraviolet and ozone, among some other chemicals, are very effective. The, as part of the ventilation controls, categories of ventilation systems must be considered in detail. There are three main types of, or categories of ventilation systems. The mechanical ventilation, which is driven by fans for fully enclosed spaces. Natural ventilation, driven by wind or density generated pressure differences for spaces partially open to the outside environment, for example, using doors and windows. And hybrid ventilation, which are mixed mode relying on both mechanical and uh, natural ventilation. Mechanical ventilation, ventilation has some advantages. Suitable for all climates, provides more control and comfort, while the disadvantages are that it can malfunction and it's not fail safe. It could be expensive and energy intensive. Natural ventilation, on the other hand, is suitable for warm climates, provides high ventilation rates and potentially energy savings, but it's difficult to control and it's possibly less comfortable. A subcategory of mechanical ventilation are positive pressure mechanical ventilation. In these systems, new air is fanned or pumped or pushed into the vent uh, ventilation space and it would go out through the exhaust at some other location. Because a positive pressure is built, uh, any uh, air would uh, leak out of the existing gaps in the system or so-called exfiltration. These systems that are positively pressured I, are pressurized are used in surgery rooms uh, for the obvious reason that uh, no source of infection would be allowed to leak in so all the air should leak out of a space. The other subcategory of mechanical ventilation is the negative pressure ventilation. In this case, air is pushed out or sucked out through the exhaust and it's pulled in at intake. This situation creates a negative pressure with the consequence that um, any air leakage would go inside the room through the gaps or so-called infiltration. This type of negative pressurized room is used for isolation rooms. And these are cases where highly contagious uh, patient is being uh, cared for and no um, air or pathogens, uh, source of infection are a desire to go out of that room. So that's why all the airs, air uh, through the leakages would go in the room. Ideally, COVID-19 patients must be kept in such a room, but in the pandemic situation where a hospital space may be repurposed, um, this may not be the case. We use different metrics to assess the performance of the ventilation system. The first metric is the air change per hour that determines how many times the volume of the room is ventilated per hour. 
it can be calculated by dividing the air flow rate through the room in cubic meter per hour by the volume of the room itself in cubic meter. For instance, if air change per hour in a room is equal to 2, that means twice the volume of the room is ventilated every hour. So if this box was my room and air change per hour was 2, every hour twice the volume of the room um, would be ventilated or air displaced uh, through this room. Higher air change per hour ventilation systems dilute contaminant faster, but as a consequence, they result in high mixing uh, of the air. On the other hand, lower air change per hour systems are slower in diluting the contaminant, and the mixing of the contaminant in the, rain is, in the air is also low. To demonstrate the difference visually, you could have a very well mixed ventilation system with a high air change per hour. If a contaminant would be released from the source, because of the high turbulent mixing, it will quickly fill out the entire room. But the result being that a low concentration of the contaminant will be built everywhere in the room. On the other extreme, you could have a displacement ventilation system where a low air change per hour is used. In these systems, other mechanisms help uh, moving the contaminant out of the room. For instance, the thermal plume of the occupant or equipment, uh, power consuming equipment in the room can help air rise by buoyancy force and then contaminant would leave the exhaust. In these systems, the plume does not mix uh, readily or very effectively, and the contaminant uh, could have regions of high and low concentrations, depending on the location in the space you are considering. Perhaps a better metric to use to uh, study the quality of a ventilation system is the ventilation effectiveness. Unlike air change per hour, which is a bulk measure for the entire room, ventilation system is point specific. It can be calculated by uh, dividing two differentials. For example, concentration of the pollutant at exhaust minus the concentration of the pollutant at supply can be divided by the concentration of the pollutant at any point of interest minus the concentration of pollutant at supply. And the, the number that would be calculated is the ventilation effectiveness. The higher this number, uh, the more effective the ventilation system at that point. So this is a very useful measure to calculate anywhere in, uh, in the space how effective the ventilation system is. Uh, one would possibly need some experiments, such as trace gas or aerosol experiments, to determine the ventilation effectiveness. I conducted um, a case study some years ago for a patient recovery room. This was a mock-up of a room where a patient is kept for recovery. The mock-up of the room can be seen here. So in this room, uh, air was supplied, the intake was uh, in front of a bed, the exhaust was uh, up here. I had two uh, thermal mannequins, one would be lying on a bed, another one would be a standing, an occupant, could be a visitor or a caregiver. I also had an atomizer, a device that generated aerosols to simulate a cough or sneeze. This room was also very well instrumented with many uh, temperature sensors, anemometers, and um, aerosol counter. The schematic of the room is viewed from above here. So here is the diffuser or intake of the air. Here's the bed, the patient, the atomizer, and the exhaust. And the occupant locations were here. The parametric cases investigated were uh, as follows. The first case was the base case with an air change per hour of 
basically a very low ventilation rate. In cases 2, 3, and 4, I uh, studied the strength of in, uh, injection. I studied the fast injection, a slow injection. Uh, <clears throat> in, in the remaining uh, few cases, 4, 5, 6, I changed the direction of the injection. I injected toward the wall. I injected horizontally and vertically. In case 7, I modified the metabolic rate of the occupant and I lowered the heat consumption of the occupant to see any difference made in the ventilation flow pattern and dispersion of aerosols due to the weakening of the thermal plume. In case 8, 9, uh, I relocated the occupant. In case 8, I located the occupant on the corner of the room, perhaps where a visitor would stand. And in case 9, I placed the occupant behind the injection source. Finally, in case 10, I increased the air change per hour and enhanced the ventilation rate to 3.7. Here are my results. For example, for the base case, you can see the breathing level aerosol concentration and cumulative concentration. On the left figure, I'm plotting time in seconds, 0 to 10 minutes. And on the vertical uh, axis, I'm plotting concentration in cubic micrometer divided by cubic centimeter. The injection event is right after uh, time zero where um, the concentration peaks and then gradually the concentration decays because of the room being ventilated and because of the settling uh, and surface deposition of the aerosols. I'm plotting aerosols in different size ranges, being one from half to one micron, being two from one to two and a half micron, being three from two and a half to five micron and the total uh, size altogether from half to five micron. On the right, I'm showing the cumulative concentration where I integrate the concentration from time zero all the way up to 10 minutes. Here, the relevant unit becomes cubic micron second times cubic centimeter. What actually result in uh, infection spread is exposure, which is a proxy for dose of uh, inhaling pathogens. So the exposure is more directly relevant to uh, possibility and probability of infection as opposed to concentration. As I said, exposure is proxy for dose. Here is a summary of the 10 parametric case studies that I conducted. I have um, shown the normalized exposure on the vertical axis, but that's calculated by dividing the exposure for any given case by the reference exposure, basically case one. And on the x-axis, horizontal axis, I'm showing the 10 cases. You can see that uh, a few um, combination of the para parameters result in lowering uh, the exposure. Most effective is moving out of the injection and moving behind the injection. That's case nine, results in the lowest exposure. The next successful mitigation is increasing the ventilation rate or air change per hour. Um, other mitigations also helped, for example, injecting uh, into the wall or basically impacting the aerosols on the surface as you would sneeze into your arm or into a napkin. However, some other cases did not help and in fact exacerbated exposure. Uh, case 7 was where the metabolic rate of the occupant was decreased. So the thermal plume that um, removed uh, aerosols from the breathing zone uh, was disturbed. So a lot of aerosols remained in the breathing zone. Another uh, important result here is the lowest bin aerosols uh, were less sensitive to the parametric study. 
So these are the aerosols that fill out the entire room anyways, uh, regardless of the mitigation measures tried here. If they are the heavier or larger aerosols that show a response to the different parameters set. So again, the effectiveness of these measures uh, would have different um, level of impact according to the size of the aerosols considered. There are a lot of functional spaces used in healthcare facilities, specifically hospitals. So this table lists them. Uh, you might have surgery and critical care spaces in a hospital. These rooms uh, typically have very large air change per hour and they're all positively pressurized. Again, because no infection source would be allowed to come in and all the um, air and um, would have to leak out of the room. There are inpatient nursing spaces, including recovery rooms, protective environment, airborne infection isolation and corridors. Most notably, the protective environment must be positively pressurized because um, these rooms contain probably immunocompromised patients living with AIDS or some other uh, conditions. So no infection sources are allowed to come in. On the other hand, airborne isolation rooms are negatively pressurized. These are rooms that contain highly contagious patients. So the uh, room must be negatively pressurized and nothing must leave out the cracks and gaps. The skilled nursing facilities, lower ventilation rates with no specific uh, requirement for uh, pressure setting. There are laboratories with different uh, pressure settings depending on the type of specimen that's being tested in the laboratory. Does not diagnostic and treatment sterilizing a supply and um, central medical and surgical supply. Interestingly, st sterilizing a supply must be negatively pressurized. These are dirty tools that must not leak out any pathogens. However, the sterilized uh, and the tools uh, required for surgery must be in a positively pressurized rooms because no contamination should go in and deposit onto those tools before an operation the service and the support. So you could imagine the air change per hour and uh, pressure settings could vary a lot uh, in the according to the category of space. These must be considered as the room is possibly being repurposed uh, in response to COVID-19. So must be considered air change per hour and pressure settings. Ideally, uh, also, the ventilation effectiveness must be investigated in any given room. It's a little more difficult to mm, determine that, but simple experiments such as trace gas or aerosol experiments can be conducted to uh, determine the ventilation effectiveness of a space. In a pandemic situation like we are having right now, an overwhelmed facility um, might use space for a different purpose than it was originally intended to. So it's extremely important that these considerations be made. A very effective strategy is to direct contaminant toward the exhaust um, of a room. Uh, simple measures can be put in place, for instance, moving the, the contaminant source closer to the exhaust, so any aerosolized pathogens would uh, leave directly. Also, uh, one may use physical barriers between the patient and caregivers as another uh, layer of uh, security for preventing aerosols to be um, uh, inhaled by the caregivers. One can even use uh, basic diagnostic tools for simple experiments, such as a smoke pen or a fog generator, to determine the main airflow patterns in a room and the best configuration to direct the contaminant toward the exhaust.
in a pandemic situation where the healthcare facilities are overwhelmed, uh, a lot of field hospitals are being developed. We've seen gymnasiums, parks, theaters uh, have been turned into field hospitals. The ventilation system for field hospitals are case specific. Any space has a different uh, ventilation design that was intended according to building code for the original use of the space. So in these uh, pandemic situations, every space must be examined uh, with careful uh, attention to details. Uh, particular challenges involve managing airflow, partitioning the space, uh, bed spacing and service arrangement. Also ventilation effectiveness can be improved by design and testing. Uh, as I said, using simple measures such as smoke or fog generators. Here you see an example of a field hospitals. Uh, beds are positioned with a conservative distance, so that's a good measure. But that's not all that can be done. One might partition the space um, very wisely or reconfigure beds so pathogens would find their way out of the exhaust ports. Um, ventilation controls also involve use of filtration. Uh, filtration is typically used throughout uh, most ventilation systems. Uh, the rating that's used to determine the effectiveness of a filter in capturing uh, aerosols uh, is uh, called Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value or MIRV. And MIRV determines the effectiveness of uh, capturing aerosols of a particular size range. For instance, here you see a MIRV rating from 1 to 4 is effective in capturing large aerosols greater than 10 micron, whereas a higher rating uh, MIRV uh, would correspond to filters that are most effective in capturing finer aerosols. The highest MIRV rating is 17 to 20. That's effective in capturing aerosols less than 0.3 microns. These uh, nerve rating uh, filters, 70 to 20, are also known as high efficiency particulate air or HEPA filters, and these are most effective for capturing aerosols possibly containing COVID 19, given that expiratory events, such as breathing, talking, coughing, sneezing, can produce very tiny aerosols. However, MERV 70 to 20 or HEPA filters uh, have some difficulties. They block the flow, so there are situations where um, <clears throat> they can result in large amount of energy consumption by buildings. They could be compromised to save energy, and they could be they could have been replaced by lower MERV rating. So one has to check carefully to check the um, rating of the filter in use in the ventilation system. They're difficult to clean and they are somewhat pricey, so it's important to inspect uh, filters throughout the ventilation system of a space being considered to respond to a pandemic. Another note is that many ventilation spaces use recirculation of air. So this concept is mainly implemented to reduce energy consumption of buildings. Normally, for a system without circulation, all of the exhaust air would leave ejected to the outside environment. However, recirculation captures a fraction of the exhaust air and remixes it with fresh air to be ventilated into a space. This is potentially hazardous, especially if contagious air aerosols can make their way back into the space. When recirculation is involved, um, ASHRAE 170 standard mandates use of two filter banks before and after an air handling unit uh, to help uh, collecting any particles. Air handling unit typically um, dries or humidifies air or cools or heats air depending on the climate zone or season. 
The presence of filter bank 1 and filter bank 2 ensure that any aerosols, whether they're coming from outside or from the recirculated air, are captured. ASHRAE 170, the standard for healthcare facilities, specifies a minimum MERV rating for filter bank number 1 and 2 according to the space designation. Uh, it has uh, recommended a filter bank number one for most spaces, although um, filter bank number two is only recommended for some spaces. The most stringent uh, uh, measure is for protective environment rules uh, where a HEPA filter is used in filter bank number two. But no other designated space is required to have a HEPA filter. So this is a particular challenge, especially in pandemic situations, uh, that many inhalation systems with recirculation are risky and they could result in recontaminating the space. Again, unless the room is protective environment, there's a chance that a higher uh, rating filter is not used. So it's all the more reason to check the filters in most rooms, especially those that recirculate air and make sure a HEPA filter is, pl is put in place. Um, if that's not possible, at least uh, the recirculation system should be deactivated. There is a lot of uh, discussion and debate about uh, personal protective controls nowadays. Uh, personal protective controls are the last line of defense against airborne infection. Face masks are being considered widely nowadays. And I came across a study by Bowen who studied effectiveness of different masks in capturing airborne aerosols. In this study, four types of masks were used an N95 mask designed to have a close facial fit and have efficient filtration of airborne aerosols. Surgical masks are used uh, in situations uh, for loose fitting, very disposable, and at best they create a physical barrier between the mouth, nose, and the outside environment. Dust masks are comprised of flexible paper and they cover over the mouth and nose. They are used in many industrial applications for dusty environments. Finally, the bandana mask is a homemade mask made out of commercial fabric that's turned into a mask. What is the aerosol collection efficiency of a mask? In aerosol science, we define collection efficiency in a very specific way. It's the ratio of the number of collected over input aerosols. And you can express that ratio in percent. For instance, if you have a mask, to calculate that ratio, you can measure the input number concentration of aerosols, Ni, and you can measure the output number concentration of aerosols, N0. You can take the difference, divide by the input number concentration. That gives you the collection efficiency of the mask. So Bowen did measure this on the normal breathing condition for aerosol size of 1.6 micron. So this size is very typical of expiratory aerosols that are injected by a carrier of the virus. And uh, it was found that most efficient is the N95 mask filtering up to 90% of aerosols, uh, even though not 100%, but this could mitigate uh, airborne spread. However, the other three masks uh, tested showed much lower collection efficiencies. Surgical mask about 30%, dust mask about 6%, and bandana mask about 11%. So while there is ongoing debate whether or not masks should be or should not be used 
in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's good reason to at least wear it for infected individuals who might be spreading uh, the disease. There are other uh, measures of control uh, that are considered for performing medical procedures. For instance, the intubation procedure is applied to many COVID-19 patients. The intubation procedure itself can generate aerosols, which would uh, put uh, a risk on the health healthcare worker lives. So these aerosol generating procedures too can be mitigated. One such mitigation measure is use of an intubation box. This is a form of a physical barrier that's placed between the patient and the team of healthcare providers that are performing this operation. So as you can see in the figure, uh, the doctor is being physically uh, shielded uh, with the patient. There are two access holes the hands are placed in and tubes are in placed inside the respiratory tract of a patient who might cough or sneeze during the operation, but there's an extra physical bar barrier. Here's a more detailed concept of an intubation box developed by Dr. Stephen Rojak, mechanical engineering at the University of British Columbia, who used to be my graduate advisor. In this case, a box is envisioned to cover the entire body of the patient while having only an access port to the outside. In this design, air is also sucked out of the box using a vacuum pump and a HEPA filter that could collect any aerosols generated. Uh, it's precautionary to vent any excess air that the pump uh, ejects into the exhaust. This kind of system could be also effective or even maybe more effective than intubation boxes that are half open to the environment. And any design of an intubation box can uh, also be tested using a smoke or fog generator. So I hope that the collection of information provided is useful, particularly for um, healthcare workers that are busy in hospitals providing care to the COVID-19 patients. I'll be very glad to continue cons uh, conversations with uh, different parties involved, manufacturers, health healthcare workers, policymakers, um, for a, a rapid and swift response to mitigate uh, the current pandemic. So please feel free to contact me and stay safe.